Hi friends, I understand that this video has a Christmas tree in the background that it's super late and that I'm trying to get more consistent. I'm very, very, very sorry. But I just want to say, ignore the Christmas tree in the background. Get excited for this video. We're going to be talking about immigration and thank you very much for working with me in this crazy time. I appreciate it. Also, look at my outfit. Okay, that's it. Have a great day. Thanks for watching. Merry Christmas. Very good. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I got a new camera. I'm a real YouTuber. I did it, Ma. Hopefully this audio turns out well because this is kind of a newish microphone as well. So, uh... All of my hard work is gonna just hopefully come to fruition, right? As you can see behind me, it is Christmas. This probably sounds awesome. Perfect, you can't even tell. All right, like I said, I got a new camera, I got a new microphone. Hopefully, things are perfect and there's nothing that goes wrong ever again, technologically speaking. Oh, do you wanna chill? So friends, happy Christmas. Thank you for joining me. Welcome or welcome back. This is my channel. My name is Hannah Ruth Savita, also known as The Woman in Wool. And on this channel, we talk history and make clothing. Today, we're making a bunting with Christmas puddings on it because holy shit, that's adorable. And somebody requested it and it's a custom order and I'm making money from it. Hawa! Why do we do this? Because true crime and makeup are oversaturated and I want to. For newcomers and first timers, my name is Hannah Ruth Savita. I moved to Dublin, Ireland in 2016, and ever since then I have made it everybody else's business. Now, returning friends, you might have recalled that I said I was gonna be in New York for this video, and I was in New York, and there's a lot of footage of that yet to come, but then I got a cold and everything went haywire and I couldn't film this video in New York, so now it's so late, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to be more consistent as a YouTuber, and I think that's gonna be my New Year's resolution, is to get a video out every two weeks, no matter what, because that's what I wanna be doing. I wanna be doing YouTube, and I wanna be making clothes, so apologies. But yes, I did go to America, the land of my people, land of my birth, uh, for the cultural holiday of Thanksgiving, and after this video and the content and the educational bit, I am going to be bringing you just a little mini vlog of my Thanksgiving and what I experienced, just so this way I can show my thanks to you. Because what I'm really grateful for this year are you guys. I quit my job earlier this year. I know it's December, but in January I was working, I'll admit, a kind of a dead-end job. And in the middle of this year, I quit it to focus full-time on me and this. I was staring down the barrel of tech support and tech work forever. And as you guys who know who watched my last video, that would have been my idea of a personal hell. So here I am doing what I want to be doing, figuring it out along the way, and joining me and making this all possible is you guys. So I just want to say thank you. And for that, you're all invited to my Thanksgiving vlog at the end of this. So thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me. You're all amazing. And like I said, no offense to anybody who does do full-time tech work and loves it and really appreciates it, but I was so happy to be able to start my own social media journey in all seriousness and open up my Etsy store in full. So I appreciate that. And I want to get this right. And I've been humbled, educated, loved, gassed up, and virtually befriended by you guys. And I'm so thankful for all of that that I wanted to share it with you. And what better way to do that by inviting you all to Thanksgiving. So at the end of this video, there's a little vlog style something or another of my Thanksgiving and my family's Thanksgiving. And they all want to say hi and thank you as well. So you're all invited to a quaint little Thanksgiving in the American suburbs. Truly the dream, isn't it? All I have Anyway, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video. You get it? Because there's Irish immigration. There was a potato fan. So let's start with the basics. Ireland is one of the most emigrated countries in the world, if not the most emigrated country. I couldn't find any direct evidence for this, but I know that it's one of the most emigrated countries in the world. Between the years of 1845 and 1882 alone, Ireland lost 6 million people to emigration and a further 1 million to starvation. Now the Celt-centric of you out there will know that this is because it is between the years of the famine or the great hunger, but I will be getting into that because it is nuanced and I have more to say about it and it's infuriating. So the people in Ireland left a lot and it wasn't just during the famine and it wasn't even just during the times of black and white photographs. In 2002, 59,600 people from Ireland moved abroad as opposed to the 54,000 in 2021. Now, my own theory is that this had a lot to do with COVID and medical care and people who were working in medical care and the people who were waiting to move abroad were waiting until after the COVID regulations lifted. But it is still a thing that many people in Ireland do. And it's a thing many young people in Ireland do. And to be honest, as somebody who emigrated from my own country at 25, I understand where they're coming from. Nowadays, it's the promise of adventure, maybe finding love, trying something new or other opportunities 
communities. Maybe a lot of your family and friends had done something similar and it doesn't seem to be a lot for you here in your home country. Or in my case, an Irish guy smiled at you seven years ago and now you can't imagine living anywhere without spice bags. Honestly, that should be the Irish Immigration Service's motto. Come for the men, stay for the spice bags. But at the peak of Irish immigration in the 1800s and early 1900s, there was some far more prevalent and serious reasons as to why people left. So for the first section of this video, I'm gonna be going through what I call push and pull factors to the Irish immigration situation. So push factors describe the reasons that individuals might emigrate from their homes, including poverty, lack of social mobility, violence, or persecution. Pull factors describe the reasons that an individual might settle in a particular country. And that's from refugees.org. So a push factor might be something that's going on in your home country that makes it impossible or very hard to stay. And pull factors are things that attract you about the country you're going to. So for me personally, a push factor out of the United States might be that I was turning 26 soon. And given the law of Obamacare in the country at the time, this is around the time that I would have stopped being covered by my parents' health insurance. And I did not at the time have a job that covered my health insurance should I get sick or injured. So if I did get an injury or an illness, I could have incurred serious medical debt. But this isn't why I moved. This is just kind of an example of why Americans do move sometimes. I was more of a pull factor, which is what a lot of Western immigration is based on these days. My pull factor was that my partner had wanted to move back to Ireland for some time at that point and invited me to come with him. So I did. That was the main reason, to be honest. Also, I kind of always wanted to live abroad, but never got the opportunity. So there it was. So push factors for Ireland. Though it seems Irish folks had been going to America since before the Tudor era, Irish mobility to the United States or America or the Americas at that point had started in larger numbers around the 1700s, which perfectly aligns with our first push factor, penal laws. Not penile laws, be normal. Penal laws. The first set of penal laws were published in 1695, and for anyone unfamiliar, these laws were put in place to kind of move Catholics into converting to Protestantism, as England had only recently changed the national religion of England to Protestantism. Think King Henry VIII desperately trying for a son. The first set of penal laws were published in 1695. Examples of some of these penal laws would be exclusion of Catholics from holding office, ban of intermarrying, Protestants and Catholics, exclusion from legal professions, forbidden from owning weaponry, illegalization of the Irish language, outlawing Irish sports like hurling and camogie, and the inability to pass all of your land down to just one offspring. This one is nuanced. For example, let's say you own 10 acres of land and you have five sons. Boys were kind of in charge at that point. The normal protocol would be to pass the 10 acres down onto your firstborn son and have the other five sons either inherit dowries from their wives or work for the firstborn son. Now let's say that Junior also marries a woman with a dowry, so he has 20 acres. Well, that's a pretty hefty chunk for a Catholic man, don't you think? He might even rent out the land to other people to live on. He might even incur wealth. And we can't have that. So the law was you had to divide your land equally amongst all of your sons or children. I assume they meant sons, but they did say children. And for a Catholic family of that era who might not have access to or even believe in any form of contraception, this could be a lot of children. And it whittled down and down further and further into the generations, where your grandfather might have had 10 acres you might only have one or two. And eventually this became nothing as the laws eventually prohibited Catholics from owning land at all. This was a tactic enforced by these penal laws to prevent any generational wealth from growing. The list goes on and on, but many of these penal laws were just blatant attempts to stop Catholics from gaining any kind of prosperity and a clear oppression of the Irish Catholics. Because if you had the ability to express your religion, which opposes the monarch, then what's stopping you from opposing the monarch in any other way? Who says you won't rebel against the monarch? This could be treason. And the British at that time were in the middle of building an empire, so they they didn't have time to waste or the troops to waste on their home soil. So it was toe the line Irish Catholics or pay the price. So suffice to say, a lot of the Irish left in order to pursue opportunities for themselves not given to them based on the oppressive laws in their own country. And while the penal laws made life somewhat impossible for the Irish already, and while most of them were able to work on the farmlands of, let's say, Protestant or Anglo-Irish landlords, there was something coming on the horizon, the famine. Now, there is some discrepancy as to the description or the definition of what happened. Was it a famine? Was it a genocide? I'm gonna read this off because I don't want to get it wrong. I am not a professional nor an academic on this subject, so I am not allowed to make that call. And while I agree that the actions taken by England and of course the crown during the Great Hunger directly caused the death of over one million people, I do not have the education or the expertise to verify one way or another the exact vocab word to label this horrific event. So while I agree it was not a famine in Ireland in the holistic sense of the word in that there was food but the Irish couldn't eat it, I will continue to use the word famine as so that people know what I am referencing or I will use 
use the word the hunger in order to make sure that I am giving it the respect that it deserves. Just So just know that I understand the complexities and the nuance of what happened in the famine and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that now, but that I will continue to use the word hunger just out of sheer habit. And so that people who are not aware of the nuances and the complexities surrounding the famine or the great hunger will know what I'm talking about. For those confused, let's get into it. In 1845, the start of the famine, the main systems, and especially in rural Ireland, were as follows. Anglo-Irish landlords owned tons of farmland and allowed the Irish to stay on it in exchange for rent and labor of the farmed land. And it was not just potatoes. There were other crops that were fostered and farmed in Ireland at the time, but most of this food was sent off to England or the mainstay of the UK island at the time. It wasn't called the UK at the time. It was called Britain, I'm pretty sure. Gotta Google that. But the poor Irish farmer was left with mainly potatoes as their mainstay crop. The potato was easy to grow and cheap to maintain and took very, very well to the Irish habitat. So it was not exported as widely as the other foods to the other island. Then there was a blight. The potatoes got sick, essentially. Science! And because of this, there were no more potatoes to be eaten and the Irish started to starve. And the relief benefits provided by the British government under which the Irish were a part were not sufficient to help or save the Irish. Now, there is a discrepancy on whether or not this was intentional. Again, I am not the one to decide that, but just knowing what I know, it becomes harder and harder to believe that this was 100% unintentional and just a tragic, unavoidable event. But since this video is not just a review of the famine, I cannot dive in at a thousand percent. But here are some examples of famine relief efforts at the time provided by the British government and by Queen Victoria. Well, first and foremost, the exporting of the food out of Ireland and into England did not stop. Her subjects were literally starving to death and food was being pumped away from them. Secondly, the donation of 2,000 pounds by Queen Victoria. Now this may sound pretty good because adjusted for inflation, it's between 250,000 pounds and 300,000 pounds today. But then you compare it with the 10,000 pounds that the Sultan of Turkey was going to give the Irish people and you think, huh, because Queen Victoria's advisors advised her not to take this donation from the Sultan of Turkey because it was more than the donation that she had given. It would make her look bad. And my thought is, if you really cared about your subjects and wanted them to live, then you would do whatever it takes. And third, relief efforts like soup kitchens or employment. These were either limited to Protestants of the area or were laborious, pointless tasks like building roads out in the middle of nowhere in order to get by. And they did not provide nearly enough for the Catholics of Ireland. And this is where a phrase called taking the soup or becoming a super was born. You were able to get some free food if you converted to Protestantism and many Catholic folks who were starving to death did take that opportunity to convert. And in the eyes of many, sold out, which I totally understand. If you're starving to death in your own country and somebody's like, if you convert religions, give you the soup. I would probably convert without even Googling it. I would, yep, yeah, me too. That's what I am now, Protestant. Anyway, those were some push factors working against the Irish to push them out of Ireland at the time. Oppressive restrictive laws working against them, the famine, systemic poverty were all reasons to take a chance on success and head to a whole new world where nobody knows your name and there's more opportunity than there would be at home. Now onto the pull factors. Every country that the Irish ended up moving to because they moved to a lot of countries had their own specific pull factors, but since this is a video on New York, because I feel like it, then I'm gonna talk about specifically what New York had to offer. Now the phrase the American dream was not a phrase coined until 1931 when historian James Treslow Adams coined it to describe the goal of the American to achieve status and respectability no matter his birth status and to live up to one's own personal best capabilities. However, the idea of a so-called American dream was very much alive at the time and maybe not a dream, but a life. And in terms of the Irish perspective, we're talking about the ability to work and to earn a living without the restrictive penal laws and systemic poverty. For New York specifically, this was economically a growing city. Between 1780 and 1800, it grew into America's largest city. And with growth comes opportunity. New industries were coming into place and jobs were needed to build a city. More people means more jobs. More jobs means more attractive to people moving there. It became a major port city, needing people to work the docks for the incoming imports. And garment making became one of the biggest industries in New York City at the time. Fashion and clothing manufacturing were on the rise in New York and becoming the center of the field. And people were also needed to start building the infrastructure of the new up and coming city. Things like bridges, roads, housing, plumbing, and soon electric, making sure that the staff were there to keep the city that never sleeps awake. And because New York's harbor were naturally protected against things like ice and storms by the surrounding smaller islands into the port, New York City became America's largest trading port. Now, although there was work to be had and money to be made, the situation of people in New York and those moving to New York were vastly different than what the rumors in Irish sitting rooms would have you believe. The stories that circulated European countries by word of mouth were kind of becoming a game of Chinese whispers. Or telephone to my American friends. We called it telephone. Someone's cousin went out to the States and ended up getting rich because 
because they opened up a business, blah, blah, blah. And out in the States, no matter what you were born to, you too could become a rich and wealthy individual in the upper echelons of American society. There became this kind of beacon of hope that there was a place, unlike home, where your name and your background, or your father's name or your background, wouldn't be a prophecy on what you could achieve in life. What you were born to didn't have to dictate who you became. There was a place where you could work and get wealthy by doing so. There was an adage that we were taught in American schools that kind of circulated Europe at this time, that in America, the streets were paved with gold and people could live like kings. But as you probably guessed, and some of you know, that didn't happen. And the famous quotations or saying that I heard in school about this was that Europeans would come to America and say, the streets were not paved with gold. They weren't paved at all and I was expected to pave them. Meaning that a lot of Europeans when coming into America ended up working menial labor jobs that other Americans wouldn't take or would require higher pay in order to do. Sounds familiar. So that covers the push and pull factors, the why. The why people moved in the first place. And of course, depending on the time period, obviously this is a long period of time, those factors did change slightly. However, for the most part, these factors included escaping religious persecution, the possibility of achieving economic prosperity, and in the same vein, escaping systemic poverty, and and the famine or the great hunger. Now, of course, when they got there, the actual picture of what happened was not the sparkly image that they had in their head. For example, the very boats that they took to America. <laughs> Depending on the year, of course, between the 17 and the 1900s, these boats were very different. But with the peak of Irish immigration to New York ending around the 1920s, the main method of transport to get there would have been Boat. There were a lot of ports from Ireland to America in Ireland that would bring boats of people to the United States. And I'm going to talk about one of them. I'm going to talk about Cove because I like Cove. Cove at this time between the 17 and 1900s was called Queenstown. Originally it was called Cove. I'm pretty sure it was spelled the English way and then it was Queenstown and then it was Cove spelled the Irish way. Anyway, Cove is most known for being the last stop on the Titanic's main journey. However, the reason the Titanic stopped there in the first place was because it was already a huge port for Irish emigration into the United States and any good luxury ocean liner would have stopped at one of the most famous ports. And there were actually a lot of people who were using the Titanic as a way to emigrate to the United States. It wasn't just millionaires and Nepo babies. It was people who had scrounged or borrowed money to get a third class ticket to go over to the States and make a name for themselves as well. Cove is also known for the vast amounts of immigration that happened there. And the same dock that the Titanic utilized was called Heartbreak Point since it was there that a lot of people would leave Ireland and never come back. I visited Cove before going to the States. I'm going to say as a full experience thing, but actually it's because my friend got to visit Ireland for her birthday and I missed her and I love Cove and she asked me to visit her in Cove and I was like, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I brought Odie. Hey buddy, you gotta, you can't be having so many chewies. You're only a little dog. I know, you're such a good boy. You can't see him, but he's doing a good job. There is an emigration and a Titanic museum in this tiny little town of Cove, and the Titanic museum is actually in the old White Star Line building, the company that owned the Titanic. You get a name at the beginning of your tour, and then as you go about the tour, you find out if the person on your ticket that you have survived the Titanic. You get to stand out on Heartbreak Point, and it's just incredible and heavy and quite an immersive experience. And the Emigration Museum dives into what I'm diving into. Push and pull factors, where the Irish went, the welcome that they got when they got there, or the less warm welcome that they got when they got there. So absolutely go and visit Cove if you're curious. It's one of my favorite places to go in Ireland. I've been back there several times. I even toured one of the deck of cards houses that was going for sale. I couldn't buy it. Couldn't buy it. I'm so mad. <laughs> so, Cove would have been the final stop for many an Irish immigrant before heading straight on to New York City. So that's what I did. And so just like the immigrants of yesteryear, I too got on a Delta flight with my dog in the cabin and had some gnocchi before takeoff. Just like the immigrants of yesteryear. However, the folks of Ireland Pass would have taken, of course, a ship. And during the time of the Great Hunger, these were adorably nicknamed coffin ships. Notably less gnocchi, but I assume more dogs. I don't know, I'd have to look up the amount of dogs that were on there. No information was found. Now, the ships used for Irish immigration outside of the famine era were roughly the same as any other human cargo ship that I could find, but the ones of the famine era were different. Not structurally or physically, but just that people died on board at a higher rate than most other ships of the time. And we can't ignore that people would have been in a more delicate state at this time, suffering from effects of starvation and long-term hunger, but regulations for emigration ships started to take place in 1803 in Britain with the Passengers Vessel Act and were revised in 1828, but it was not entirely enforceable. Like enough food and water had to be on the ships and there was a limit to the number of passengers they could take, but people liked to cut corners and there were no officers standing around on board to make sure that these were enforced. In 1867, these laws were more enforced, making sure that people had safe journeys across the Atlantic. However, this was of course after the biggest period of Irish emigration during the famine from 1845 to 1852. A deadly combo of the sheer number of immigrants and the worst period for voyage regulation gave these ships a very high mortality 
mortality rate. Owners of these ships would have adhered to either the bare minimum for what was allowed or just ignored the requirements entirely, meaning that the quality of life for the passengers on board would have been nearly unbearable. Because there were corners cut in all areas of the ships, there oftentimes wasn't enough food or clean drinking water on board, and the overcrowding of the ship would lead to the spread of diseases like typhoid and cholera. It was estimated that over 100,000 Irish folks died on these ships on the way to America, with a mortality rate of between 20 and 50 percent. Also, there were a lot of babies born on these ships, so it wasn't all death, sometimes there was life. But my thought is, if the conditions weren't good enough for fairly healthy individuals who are fully grown to survive on these ships, then one, somebody who just gave birth, who is particularly vulnerable and susceptible to disease, is not going to survive, let alone a newborn, whose immune system is essentially <laughs> I couldn't find much on the infant mortality on board these ships, but if they were the cesspits that they were known to be, the consequences were most likely reflective of that. But, interestingly enough, these ships are responsible for the birth of something called corned beef. Now, when I was living in America, everybody knows corned beef on St. Patrick's Day everybody makes corned beef. Corned beef is a really big Irish staple of food, so we are told. But when I came to Ireland, they didn't really know what I was talking about. I mean, they had heard of it, but they were like, that's not really an Irish thing. I don't really eat it, and it's not really served in restaurants around here, even Irish restaurants or pubs. But it was because people knew there wasn't enough food on board that people would bring their own food onto these ships, including preserved salt beef or salt pork, meats that were preserved with kernels of salt that were roughly the size of corn kernels. And since corn wasn't really a crop that was grown in Ireland when they got to America, where corn is native and abundant, the Americans said that looks a bit like corn. And so the term corned beef was coined. So although folks in Ireland might say that corned beef isn't really Irish, it is. And it's specifically Irish American because of the way that this beef was preserved or the pork was preserved in order to keep on these really long journeys. That is a very interesting fact I thought in my head. There are some other reasons that I was told that corned beef was called corned beef on the TikToks that I posted, but I do have sources to back up the corned beef thing, so. During the famine, the port of New York City wasn't exactly the same as what I'm going to be focusing on, things like Ellis Island. During the famine itself, immigration into the United States was pretty openly encouraged. During this time, things like Manifest Destiny were starting to take hold, the idea that one had the God-given right to populate the United States from coast to coast, from sea to shining sea getting people to populate the United States. And the United States was starting to make a name for itself as a force to be reckoned with on the global stage. And to fuel this expansion westward and to fill a growing industrial workforce, the open and flowing influx of immigrants willing to work was encouraged. The Industrial Revolution had also just taken place and new business owners needed hands to get work done. And from that to late stage capitalism is the world that we live in today. Don't know about you, but I'm ready to get my fingies caught in a mill for six bucks a week. What do you think? However, just after the big influx of Irish immigration caused by the famine, the demand for federal intervention in immigration processing became more of a need. Had to read that one, sorry. People were sick and tired of all these immigrants coming in with little to no regulation and little to no limit into the United States. And so there came a few ports of immigration processing into the US. The one I'm going to talk about is the infamous and famous Ellis Island. Now before Ellis Island, and during the time of the famine of the 1840s, there were several ports through which you could get to the United States. Places like Philadelphia, New Orleans, and even Galveston, Texas. And I actually had a few of you guys reach out to me to say that some of your family members came in through these ports, so thank you, that's super cool. But Ellis Island was opened as a port and immigrant processing center on January 1st, 1892, and it stopped its function in 1954, which was way later than I thought it was. Ellis Island was a federal processing center, meaning that the overall United States government processed and regulated the amount and the people that came into the United States from here, whereas before it was founded, the state of New York would do this processing alone. The separation between federal government and state government still exists in the United States today, and I gotta say, that could be better. Before Ellis Island was opened as the processing center, immigrants would come in through Battery Park in Lower Manhattan. This would be happening in a building known as Castle Clinton, and that actually still stands today, and you do have to go through Castle Clinton in order to take the ferry to Ellis Island. And if you were an immigrant coming through Ellis Island, you still had to go through Castle Clinton to get into New York. But after the processing was done there, it was pretty much formalities in Castle Clinton from what I know. And then after that, you were just kind of let free in New York, really. I am going to talk about Annie Moore, but on a more personal note, this is where my great-grandfather and great-grandmother were processed through from Italy coming into the United States. They came from the same area of Italy, but only met each other in America. Isn't that funny? I could only find my great-grandfather's name while looking this up in Ellis Island, since I didn't know my great-grandmother's maiden name, and that's the name that she would have traveled under. Canio Savita. Arrived 1902, born 1882. Passenger number, port of departure, Genoa. He wasn't married to Mary at the time. Nope. 
Did they meet over here? Yeah, I think they meet over here. They were they were set up over here. Wow. What was Mary's last name? I don't know. There he is. So let's. And I assume that they were set up by their families over here since they were from the same area of Italy, but I actually don't know that bit of a story. It's a bit of a family mystery, I guess. How they met. Now, my great-grandfather Canio had his father pay for the journey. He was 20 years old at the time and came to America with $2 in his pocket. For that nowadays, I'm pretty sure you could get a punch in the face. Punch in the face, two dollars? That sounds about right. From there, he became a grave digger and bought a house in Westchester, New York. And he had 11 children with his wife, Mary. And the youngest of all of those children, number 11, was my grandfather, Tommy. And Tommy's oldest was my dad, and my dad's oldest is me. And I actually used to spend holidays in that old family home where the original Savitas, or where Canio and Mary, moved to, their house in Westchester. And now it is owned by one of my many many cousins. I've seen photos of the original Savitas my whole life growing up, and we did some family ancestry digging, and there are some really cool stories about my family that I love to hear about, but none of them would be possible without two very young people taking a very big chance on a very big city. And I'd like to think that Canio might be proud of me too. He might have a thing or two to say about me being childless, but he had enough children for all of us, all right? That's enough. Anyway, the first person to be processed through this new processing center of Ellis Island was Annie Moore, a 17-year-old Irish girl from Cove. And she traveled here with her two little brothers. She was far from the first Irish person to move to America, but she got her names in the history books by being the first person ever to be processed in Ellis Island. And in commemoration to her, Mary Robinson, Ireland's first female president, dedicated two statues to Annie Moore, one at the Immigration Museum in Cove, which is the port she left, and one in the corresponding port of Ellis Island, the port she entered in. I got a chance to see both, and it was pretty surreal. I kind of feel this little connection between Annie Moore and I, and I know that a lot of people probably feel that too, having seen both statues. But as somebody who feels a real deep connection to Cove and eventually wants to move there, and somebody who actually did live in New York and have family go through Ellis Island, I kind of feel this silly little warm connection and parallelness to Annie. I know our lives aren't the same, and Annie actually had a really hard life. I'd like to do a whole video on her at some point. And I'd like to think that we could exchange stories about our two similar homes together. And you know what? I bet she makes a fucking killer cup of tea. Mine's gone cold, actually. Anyway, that's my kind of silly little connection I feel to Annie more. City to city, girl to girl, even though our stories are vastly different. Like I said, I did have gnocchi on the journey. I don't think any more ever even heard of gnocchi. According to the Ellis Island website and the Ellis Island Museum, the processing center was processing up to 5,000 immigrants a day, mainly from the European continent. And the Ellis Island port was the main port for immigration into America by a long shot. On the island, you would have a very brief medical check, and honestly, they seem to focus a lot on the eyes, from what I saw. Now, I'm not sure if there was a common disease at the time or something going around with people's eyes that they wanted to keep out of the United States, but it seemed to focus a lot on eyesight and eye health, from what I picked up at the museum. And from a lot of the first-hand accounts that people have written down at the museum and online, it seemed that people were pretty scared of the eye exams and that there was very much a focus on eye exams. And really, honestly, unless you were falling apart at the seams, you got in. You know what's funny, actually, is that my my dad always had 20-20 vision, like perfect vision, and that's something he inherited from his father. So I assume it's something that he inherited from his parents who were the ones to go through Ellis Island. And it's kind of funny to think about maybe them getting into Ellis Island because of this genetic family trait of perfect eyesight. They all had really great eyes for most of their life. Eye privilege got them in. So that's kind of interesting to know that my family went through Ellis Island and had great vision. I got my mom's eyesight though, so fuck me I guess. And then as an immigrant, you were into New York City. But of course the Irish had a very Weird welcome. Not exactly a welcome. First and foremost, as is the case with most immigrant stories, the Americans did not like the Irish coming in. Old money New York and people trying their best to climb the social ladders after two or three generations removed from their immigrant ancestors decided that more immigrants was going to spoil the good names of New York and potentially ruin their own chances in progressing in New York City's social ladders. Especially since it was so up and coming. There are all of these new opportunities to make a name for yourself and more people being flooded directly into the city that you were trying to climb into not a favorite. And so since we're focusing on the Irish experience, I'm going to focus mainly on that. Although there were other immigrant groups that were discriminated against and oppressed at this time, this is mostly Irish history. So we're going to stay true to the name, baby. And not only were Irish folks essentially signed up to fight the Civil War as soon as they came off the ships in the New York port, that was during the time of the American Civil War, of course, but they were also openly and actively discriminated against. We've all seen the sign, no dogs, no blacks, no Irish, but this sign was actually from England from around the same time period. 
good to know that the sentiment was pretty universal. But signs that were in the same vein and idea were put around in America as well, but they weren't as catchy. Sentiments like no Irish need apply or political cartoons depicting Irish people as drunk, lazy, loud mouths were pretty much everywhere, especially on the East Coast where most of them were coming in through. Funny enough, I still see shit like this today about immigrant groups, just that the immigrant groups have changed. It looks different now, but don't be fooled, friends. Racism and xenophobia is everywhere, and it's up to us to think critically and make sure that we know when we're seeing it. Especially growing up in New York, I used to see kind of caricature depictions of Latin Americans and South Americans, things like skits and cartoons, making their voices higher, speaking Spanglish, white people in what can only be described as a costume of some sort, and thinking it's hilarious. I'm gonna start reading because I don't wanna mess this up and I wrote it out very well, I think. <laughs> These jokes are as old as time and they're not funny. Think some frat guy dressed up as a leprechaun shouting top of the morning to you while drunk off his head. Same thing as dressing in a fake sombrero made in China pretending to speak Spanish and making jumping the fence jokes. The reason people feel like it's funny to mock other cultures is because they feel superior to them in some way. Depicting inferior ethnic or gender groups is automatically thought of as humorous because why would anybody really want to be fill in the blanks. Same thing as why people think it's funny to see men dressed as women but not the other way around, and why it enrages people to see more traditionally feminine men dressing as they please in all seriousness but are turned on by a woman in a suit. Femininity, Irishness, Latin American heritage, hip hop music, AAVE, these are all examples of certain cultures that have been seen as inferior and therefore funny to depict. But time and time again, these jokes fall out of fashion as new waves of ethnic groups come to the chopping block. And the Irish were the group of the moment in the 18 to 1900s. Tangents, sorry. But I gots to do it, folks. You know I'm too woke for my own good. But back to your scheduled programming. Depictions of Irish at the time perpetuated the idea that the Irish were just drunk, lazy, loudmouths that wanted a piece of the American pie, and Americans and New Yorkers were not happy about it. However, this would not be forever. As Irish people continued to live in America and work and integrate into American culture, they stopped being the immigrant du jour, so to speak, and of course, new immigrant groups started to take the brunt of the American discrimination as well. Now, back to the immigration journey from Ireland to America. Now, from there, the Irish, they worked and they worked and they took chances and they worked even harder. <laughs> as did many immigrant groups in order to be accepted by the American public. They got jobs, they had children, they continued their exhaustive journey to becoming American, and perseverance and risk-taking became the backbone of the Irish experience and work ethic in America. The Irish had to climb uphill in their new home just to be accepted. For example, during the gold rush in the United States, at first there were rumors that there was gold in the West Coast. Now for those of you who know, the West Coast did have some gold, but unless you got there early, there was no more gold to be had. There was only a little bit and it was only at first. And then it got mined away. So only those who went first really benefited from the gold rush. So the US government was attempting to make programs and land grabs for those who moved west because they wanted to populate the west coast. And seeing this as the shot in the dark it was, established east coast families didn't have the incentive to uproot their entire life and move west. They weren't about to move their money and their resources, uproot their entire lives in the east coast and move west on the off chance of finding gold in a wild western land inhabited with strangers. But the Irish already really did that, really. They had already left behind everything they knew and loved for a chance at becoming a better person and getting more money in the new land of America. So what was one more hop, skip, and a jump over to California anyway? It's not like they knew anybody in New York. Might as well not know anybody and potentially find some gold. So those very few people who did profit from the gold rush, a lot of them were Irish, taking a chance and moving out to California, on foot by the way, in order to try and make some money. But the American media didn't love this. So instead of giving an oppressed and discriminated against ethnic group the proper recognition it deserves for taking a chance and working hard, they chalked it up to the luck of the Irish, which is where this phrase comes from. They boiled it down to Irish folks just being lucky, land of the magic and the fair you know how they do it. Playing up the stereotypes of Irish folks being drunk and lazy and just getting lucky. And that song got kind of old, not gonna lie. But through risk-taking and hard work, millions of people from Ireland managed to make a name for themselves in the American society. And now today, millions and millions of Americans claim Irish ancestry and Irish heritage. And people no longer hide their Irishness. And it's arguably one of the most celebrated ethnicities in America today. My source for that 
is every St. Patrick's Day parade in every East Coast city. Everybody goes so hard. And while I look at the pride and celebration at this once hated group, there is a spark of hope in me that someday this can be the fate of other oppressed and discriminated against groups. There's a hope that the gay pride parade will never have another hate crime committed at it. That instead of angry people quoting Bible verses at them, there will be people who proudly talk about their openly gay family members. And that people will honor their great great grandfather who might have been gay but had to hide it. And how proud they are to be descended from him. Or that there might even be national recognitions or parades for things like Juneteenth, Cinco de Mayo, or even trans celebration days. And that these parades will be just as enthusiastically celebrated as St. Patrick's Day parades. That people will wear t-shirts saying, kiss me, I'm bi. Actually, no, don't do that one. That might play into some stereotypes. We're gonna just scratch that. Yeah, let's not do that one. You get what I mean. The Irish immigration story is one of fear, resilience, hard work, and eventually celebration. And my hope is that that's what we can see in the future for other discriminated against groups. Now, that wraps up my video on today's topic. Now, for me, this was a really long filming process. It's a little bit darker now, apologies. And thank you so much for staying with me till the end. And if you made it to the end, please comment to Shamrock so this way I know you made it to the end. And I'll let you go ahead and partake in my Thanksgiving vlog now. It's cute, it's fun, it's wholesome. Follow me everywhere, buy my clothes on Etsy, name your firstborn child after me, whatever you wanna do, whatever you wanna do. And I will see you at the next St. Patrick's Day Parade. Bye. God damn it. <laughs>